Hello class. This is going to be the fourth lecture in engineering mechanics. I believe that it is because uh, lecture zero will be the introduction. And then uh, I've already done lectures one through four or, or one through three. So uh, it should be fine. Uh, we've really covered what is the first chapter in your textbook, uh, looking at the systems of units and you know, as I was going through here, I just noticed that there was one thing that I, I left out that I love to cover uh, when we're going through it. In fact, a, a couple other things uh, later on, we're gonna get to some trigonometry and trigonometric uh, identities that, um, you know, all engineers sort of keep uh, in the back of their head. So I'm just gonna call this uh, engineering, Mechanics fundamentals. We're still really in the fun. I'm not even going to finish fundamentals because I may need this for the rest of uh, the thing. But this is really getting to the original uh, point. So uh, one thing that I left out in those earlier <clears throat> discussions on units was something that your uh, book brings up. I can push that down. <laughs> but something that your book brings up, and that would be the gravitational force, right? So we know that it's uh, Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of one of the two objects that we're talking about a gravitational attraction between times the mass of the other object divided by the distance between those two objects square, right? And uh, <clears throat> Newton's gravitational constant, G, is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. And it's okay to use um, uh, minus 11 and non-multiples uh, of 3 when you're discussing scientific constants, right? Because uh, the scientific constants and scientists don't use the engineering notation of pico, nano, femto, all of those things. So you can use uh, G as 10 to the minus 11. And the units for that are meters cubed. These are the combination of primary units for Newton's gravitational constant, uh, kilogram second square, right? So... Uh, as you can see, we can figure out the force uh, between any two objects uh, if we know that. Now, you know, the, if uh, the radius of the Earth is 7,200 miles, just a second. Actually, we could, uh, um, well, you know, uh, the reason I took a second there is I, I, I was thinking in which way I wanted to teach this, but let's just look at this. We know that F, the, uh, the gravitational attraction, is equal to M times GM over R squared. And so if we look at just GM over R squared, because we know, let's just go to our weight, we know that our weight at the surface of the Earth right, is going to be equal to our mass times the gravitational constant. And we know that the gravitational constant is going to be equal to 9.81 meters per second squared, right? So <clears throat> if I look at just this right here, because isn't this mg and isn't that g equal to Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth, divided by the um, radius of the Earth. And I believe that the radius of the Earth is 3,600 miles. I'm just going to see what that would be uh, times 1609 meters. And that gives us 5.7924 million meters. So let's just write that down. 
Should I use megameters? No, that would look odd, wouldn't it? So I'm going to say that that's times 10 to the 6 meters. All right, and then we've got Newton's gravitational constant in, in uh, combination of SI units right here. So what we're going to find the weight of the Earth in is going to be kilograms, right? Does everyone see how the units work out there? I'm not going to go through all that. I'm sure that everybody can work with uh, the units that we have here and figure out how uh, that's going to be. So if we know that G equals GME, then we can figure out that the mass of the Earth, right? is going to be equal to G, Newton's gravitational, or, or you know, uh, the gravitational attraction uh, um, constant, uh, times R squared divided by Newton's uh, gravitational attraction constant. And, and let's just put the numbers in here for this, 9.81 meters per second squared. And you should get in the habit of always attaching units to all of your thing. And then R, we can see that's 5.7924 times 10 to the 6 meters. And that's going to be squared. And then we want to divide that by 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed per kilogram second squared. Now, does that all come out to uh, kilograms? Let's see uh, how this uh, would work out. If we were to put this in a, uh, a major fraction, we would have meters per second squared. This is what I call it, my major fraction. And then I would have meters, but they're squared. So that would be meters squared, right, for that. And then on bottom, I've got meters cubed per kilogram second squared, right? So how would my uh, units cancel out there if I was, uh, I'm hoping it all comes out to kilograms or I'm going to be uh, uh, very upset. <laughs> second squared, second squared. And there you go. It gives us kilograms, doesn't it? Now, I... Uh, I wish that I could say that I've already done that, but I'm going to plug it in. 9.81 times 5.7924 to the sixth power divided by 6.67 to the minus 11th power gives me 0 0.519 times 10 to the 70, oop, better get in, in uh, I mean, I'm telling you to do it <laughs> in the engineering notation. On my calculator, I actually have to hit a button, but it does give it to me. And it tells me that we are, did I do this right? Uh, let me just check this, because this says 851, so that's almost one to the 18. So let me see what we got here. We got 10 uh, and 10 to the six, so that's, uh, 10 to the 7, and then that, 10 to the minus 18 is what we're really looking at, I guess. So, uh, or 10 to the, 10 to the, yeah. So I get 851 times 10 to the 15 kilograms. No, that doesn't seem right for some reason. What did I for? Oh, I squared that. Did I square that? I hope. Let me look back here. That does doesn't. Uh, anyway, nine point eight one. You know, I may not have squared that times five point seven nine two four to the six squared divided by six point six seven to the minus eleven. Oh, my bad. Yep. Um, let's get that in engineering terms. 4.93. That's why I have this here. <laughs> you know, I, I, I say to you students also, you know, do it in your head and just check it out. And, you know, really that too, that's 12. And that's what I forgot to do was to square that. So 12, 13, I'm just talking about the magnitude. 13 and then minus 11, that should have told me immediately that that's going to be minus 24. 
right? Or, or I should say 24, not minus 24. Um, so that's right. So it's going to be 4.93. This is the good time when I actually do figure it out. Uh, times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And that, that was much more closer to what I thought. Five times 10 to the 24 is what I usually think of as the mass of the Earth. So uh, pretty close there. All right. We could go on and talk about the Earth and the layout of the Earth and all of that uh, forever, but this gives you a general idea. Now, another equation that I want to um, bring up is an equation that you have learned back probably in network uh, theory one, right? And that is, uh, you probably learned it or reviewed it again in network theory two, but, uh, what I'm talking about is Coulomb's law, right? I'm gonna see if I can get a better, a little better pen here. And Coulomb's law is very much like Newton's uh, law of gravitation, isn't it? We, we know Coulomb's law is F sub C, and that's going to be Coulomb's constant, right? Times Q1 times Q2 divided by R squared. That is not Coulomb's equation. That's Coulomb's equation that we teach to high school students. That pen's no good either. That we teach to high school students. Uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, I guess freshmen. I don't really teach it to freshmen. I always teach freshmen uh, in their, their you know, first course in uh, network theory that that's not the equation. What the equation is, is... Um, Q1 times Q2 divided by 4 pi epsilon r squared. And so when you look at uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon, and I'll just use epsilon sub 0 for the vacuum of space here, right? What, what is the... Uh, constant that you get there. And I'll tell you what epsilon is. It's 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. Uh, but that's, that's the point. So 4 times pi times 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, all taken uh, upside down, uh, gives me 9 times 10 to the 9, or 8.99. I mean, it's really 8.992 times 10 to the 9, right? Let me just write that there. And of course, the units for that, because this is in uh, farads per meter, would be in meters per farad. That would be meters per farad. That's a farad. All right. Um, I like to point that out to people too. And, and, and you know, uh, immediately what it, it probably brings to mind to you is just saying, oh my God, uh, I was taught before Coulomb's equation and that's Coulomb's constant and that's constant throughout the universe. And now I, I realize that no, Coulomb's constant isn't constant. It's only constant in the vacuum of space. And it's only, it, it, it's close to being constant uh, in the um, air. Uh, in the atmosphere, right? Because the uh, the relative permittivity of air is like 1.0004, so it's very close to the vacuum of space. The permittivity of air, permittivity of vacuum of space, almost exactly the same. So anything you do in space or in air, that's fine. But how about inside a coaxial cable? That's right. Because the relative permittivity in a coaxial cable is 2.36, isn't it? The relative permittivity of epoxy is five. Uh, the relative permittivity of barium strontium titanate is uh, 7,500. So all of a sudden, everything changes. Not only that, this has to do with the speed of light. So we know that the speed of light changes inside a dielectric, right? So all of these things. Now, what that probably says to you is, uh, Oh my God, is, is Newton's gravitational constant then uh, uh, quantized as well? 
And I've got to say, yes, it probably is. It probably is. We just have to find the media that changes, that this changes in, right? That would be great. And then we could uh, have an anti-gravity machine and we could fly all over the universe, I guess. Um, okay, so we've got that out of the way. Uh, I wanted to point those two things out and how similar they are. And then I, I want to go and look at a, a couple trigonometric identities. And you already know these because you've been working with phasers in network theory uh, two. And so with your, with your phaser knowledge, you also know really how to break down things into two dimensional uh, components, right? And so that's what I want to look at first and just uh, review a little plane trigonometry. Let's say that I had, uh, you know, whether we're talking about the complex plane or whatever, let's say that I had a Cartesian grid system here, right? I have a Cartesian grid system here and I want to find out what the components of a triangle would be, what the sides of a triangle would be, right? So let's put a right triangle in here. If I wanted to find out those two sides, uh, well, that would be my hypotenuse, wouldn't it? This would be my hypotenuse uh, right here. And let's say that the uh, hypotenuse was, um, just to give you some numbers, five. And let's say that this side over here is three and this side over here is four units long. How would I find out what the angle of theta or the angle of alpha is going to be uh, in that triangle? And I think that everybody who's here should already know this and this is just really review, but uh, uh, that's what I, I sort of wanted to point out. We can easily do that by using our things. We know a couple things. We know that the uh, tangent of theta is going to be the opposite over the adjacent side, right? So the opposite over the adjacent side. Or we know that the tangent's going to be 0.75. We know what the sine of theta is going to be because the sine of theta is the opposite side over the hypotenuse or it's three fifths or it's 0.6, right? We also know what the cosine of theta is going to be. The cosine of theta is going to be the adjacent side four over the hypotenuse five. So it's gonna be 0.8, right? We also could find out what theta is. We could find out what theta is by saying theta equals the inverse tangent of 0.75, right? So we just punch into our calculator uh, what the inverse tangent of 0.75 is, and that's 36.8. 699. I'm going with 8687. 36.87. And we could really put a zero on there because it's uh, 99 afterwards. So we could say it's zero. And that and a line over the top indicates that, that zero is a significant figure. Because a lot of times when you see zero, you wonder, God, is that a significant figure or is it not a significant figure? Do I, do I have the ability to use that in future calculations or is that just been a rounding off or something? No, that is not a rounding off, it is zero um, because it's really 0 0.86990. <laughs> so, but the nine nine throws it up there as a positive, as as definitely a significant number at zero. Now let's look at our calculator. If I was to do theta is going to be the inverse sine of 0 0.6, I should of course get exactly the same uh, thing, shouldn't I? And I do. 
So at least on my calculator, uh, it might be interesting to see <laughs> on your calculator if you get the same thing. But it's just an expansion series, of course, uh, geometric expansion series that figure all of these things out using numerical. All that the, the calculator ever does is really juice, juice, plus, minus, and times, and divide. Uh, and, and these are just, you know, programs inside of the calculator. All right. Now, looking at that, you can also figure out what all the other things are. Now, if I was to, instead of making it on a Cartesian coordinate system like that, I was to put it on a Cartesian coordinate system like this, right? Uh, to, to figure out what my, my uh, thing is. And so I just want to look at the, the unit circle for a second. And of course, on the unit circle, this is your cosine uh, axis, and this is your sine axis, and the radius of the circle is always one unit. That's why it's called the unit circle, right? So we can always figure out what the cosine and sine are of any angle, because the angle goes off the positive cosine axis. I should put sine x, cosine x, perhaps, uh, is always positive off that axis. So. So we can figure out, just by looking at that, we can always come up with a right triangle, no matter where that is, right? To, to figure out what the uh, cosine is. That would be my cosine, and of course, uh, this would be my sine for whatever that angle is that I've got there, right? Cosine and sine axes. And, and of course, this is zero in the, in the center for both of those. So this would be negative. I mean, if I wanted, of, of course, I think everybody already knows this. This would be, if I, if I cosine first, that'd be a one, zero, right? And this would be uh, zero, one. This would be minus one, uh, zero, of course. And then this would be uh, zero minus one, as far as cosine and sine go all the way around there. And so we have to you know, remember which quadrant we're in and, and what the positivity and negativity of our uh, things are. Now, <clears throat> that all being said, this is more or less just a review to give you some additional uh, tools by which to solve problems and, and, and ways to look at problems. This, of course, the unit circle is something that every engineer, you know, just knows by heart. Uh, all of these things are just known by, by heart as far as your trigonometric um, operations. Here is one that I would say is not really uh, known at heart, but, but is used by um, a lot. Oops, that's not straight. <laughs> used by a lot of engineers. Let's say that those lines are actually straight. I'll try to straighten them out without making them look like I'm putting a shadow in here. There we go. So that's just an obtuse triangle, right? So let me draw that angle, as you can see, is gonna be greater than 90 degrees, and these angles down here are going to be uh, less than 90 degrees, right? I'm just going to label each of these sides. That's side A, this is side B, and this is side C. This is angle gamma. This is angle alpha. And this is angle beta. All right, does everyone see how uh, that, that works? So, this is called the cosine law. The cosine law says that A squared, the length of A, side A, squared, equals B squared plus C squared minus, I better put it down here, 2BC cosine alpha. All right, so that's a minus sign. And then that comes down there. Boy, that didn't work out too well, did it? You know, just to make sure that everybody sees that that is the cosine law, 
I am going to block this out. All right. And I want to, to make sure everybody sees that minus. That's a minus, right? Minus 2BC cosine alpha. And, and I've given you the name there. So in case the, everybody was uh, questionable as to what it was, you can always just punch it into Google and it'll pop right up, I'm sure. All right. Now, we also have what's called the sine law for the same thing. And I'll, I'll hopefully... <laughs> not make the same mistake that I did uh, before and just write this thing out. So A over sine of alpha, which is the opposite side. See, A and alpha are opposite from one another. Does everyone see that? Is equal to B over the sine of beta. And that's equal to C over the sine of gamma. So one of them is the cosine law that applies to non-right triangles, and the other one is the sine law that applies to those as well. Okay. So those are just good, good things, you know. And every once in a while, you you uh, you run across something like this, and you say, "Oh God, you know, I'm looking at a triangle, and uh, you know." I, I could apply the cosine law, I could find out something uh, very quickly that otherwise uh, breaking the things down into their individual components would take me much longer to do. So that's what we've handled uh, so far. So we've gotten some things uh, out of the way. We've looked at uh, Newton's gravitational uh, attraction law. We've looked at Coulomb's law and how Coulomb's law works into that. And you know, is there some magic like dielectric constant where gravity actually changes inside that constant, inside that media? I don't know. Uh, it would be interesting to find that out. <laughs> uh, and then we wanted to look at uh, a review, really. That's what I'm calling this because everybody who's gotten to this point in their education has already worked with phasers and complex numbers and knows how to break things down into two-dimensional components, right? With the complex number plane, it's only two-dimensional at your level. So um, now we're going to start to get into vectors. And when we get into vectors, that's going, everything's going to be broken down into components, but not just two-dimensional components. Uh, we'll have three-dimensional components. Let me just draw a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate grid right here. Right, so that's a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate grid, and I'm going to use blue to represent a point on this grid, right? So if I went over three, Let's say I go over four, then I go up three, then I go out a certain distance. Oh, why don't I come up here? Why don't I do this? I'll go way out here, and I'll come up here, and I'll just go out a little distance along there. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, although that, that won't be... So that would be about three, right about there. Okay, so here's what I'm, I'm actually doing. I'm going, I hope I got that right. Yeah. Let's look at a three-dimensional point in space. Now I'm going to draw the vector directly from the origin straight to that spot in space. Does everybody see that? And that now is a vector, a three-dimensional vector. How far have I gone along the x-axis? One, two, three, four, five, six right? Six along the x-axis. 
And then how far have I gone along my y-axis here? One, two, three, four. So six along the x and four along, let's write that down. Uh, so that vector, I'll call that vector A. And I've put the little arrow top the, uh, across the top of the vector. And so that tells us that it's a vector. It's not a scalar. A scalar wouldn't have the arrow across the top. So I know that my vector A so far is six i hat. Why am I saying i hat? Because it's a unit vector. A unit vector. Let's draw another. Another uh, three-dimensional thing there. What is a unit vector? A unit vector is a one. Now, could, could it be one meter per second? Sure. One meter per second squared? Sure. One uh, Newton? Sure. You know, that, that's, that's the, the dimension. So one unit in, in, I, in the x direction, this is the x, is called i hat. One unit in the, J, in the y direction is called j hat. You know, get used to the uh, uh, correct engineering terminology. And one unit in the z direction, this would be z, is going to be k hat. All right? So the reason I'm saying six i hat is because I'm multiplying it six, right? You know, this, uh, this, this uh, vector that I've got right here, could it be a force vector? Sure. Could it be an acceleration vector? Sure, right? Because all of those denote as a vector magnitude and direction. Now, what's the difference between a scalar and a vector. Let's, let's look at this. Velocity is a vector, right? Velocity is a vector. I, I, it, it gives me two things. It gives me magnitude and direction. That's the definition of velocity. It's a vector and it gives you magnitude and direction. So if I said I was driving 60 miles an hour south, right? 60 miles an hour south, that's velocity. Speed is a scalar. Speed only gives you the magnitude, but not the direction. So if I'm saying I'm going 60 miles per hour, that's speed, that's a scalar. If I say I'm going 60 miles per hour due south, that's a vector. If I say I'm going uh, uh, 60 miles per hour uh, toward New York City, that's a vector, that's velocity, because I'm giving you both magnitude and direction. But a scalar only gives you magnitude with no direction. This, A, is a vector. So let's, let's continue this. So 6i hat, 6 you know, units in that direction, 6i hat. And then 4j hat. I'm going up, right? So it's positive. So plus 4j hat. And then how far am I coming out here? Well, that looks to be uh, one, two, three. So this is one, two, three in the Z direction, the Z right here, Y, X. So we're using our unit vectors that we've got. And that is coming out in the positive Z direction. So that's plus three k hat. Does everybody see how that works? Okay, 
So that's sort of a, just a, an introduction to three-dimensional vectors. Now, you're probably saying, hey, you know, does this work like Pythagorean theorems? If I square all of those and take the square root, will that give me the distance A here, right? If I wanted to find out what the, this, this length is, or this distance of A, the magnitude of A is right here, right at that point. Could I just square the individual distances? And then that would give me the, the total distance and the square root of that would give me the total distance. So if I had six squared plus four squared plus three squared, and took the square root of that, would that be the length of A? That's probably what you're asking yourself right now. And the answer, of course, is yes. That is Pythagorean, uh, Pythagoras' theorem, isn't it? Right? So 36 plus 16 plus 9 taken to the square root is 7.81, 7.81, whatever it is, meters per second. Let's say that we're, we're, we're dealing in, uh, let's just work with meters right now. Three-dimensional, so that would be meters down there, 7.81 meters, and that's the length of our vector. You know, um, of course, distances have uh, a direction, so they are vectors. They can be vectors just like, you know, some things can be vectors, some things can't be vectors. You know, how could a temperature be a vector? You know, the direction of temperatures, which would be heat flow, is a vector. But temperatures are really a scalar field, okay? All right, <laughs> I'm gonna hold it there right now. That's uh, quite a long uh, uh, first introduction to engineering mechanics fundamentals lecture. Uh, there's gonna be a lot more of those. All right, see you soon.